Well, good morning, all. The uh, White House Coronavirus Task Force met today here at the Department of Education, part of our ongoing effort to focus on a mission to save lives, meet the needs of our states, our health care workers, to protect the vulnerable, and to safely reopen America and reopen America's schools. Uh, as you will hear today uh, from uh, Admiral Brett Girard, at this point we have tested more than 39 million Americans. Among those, uh, more than 3 million Americans have tested positive and more than 1.3 million Americans have recovered. Uh, sadly, more than 133,000 Americans have lost their lives and our sympathies are with all of the impacted families. And while we mourn with those who mourn, because of what the American people have done, because of the extraordinary work of our healthcare workers around the country. Uh, we are encouraged uh, that the average fatality rate continues to be low and steady. And at days earlier this week was actually 90% lower than at the height of this pandemic. Again, it's a credit to the sacrifices the American people have made, to the extraordinary work that our healthcare workers are doing. And and we pledge this task force, working in partnership with governors all across the country, is going to continue to work our hearts out 24 hours a day to continue to keep our losses low. Um, in just a few moments, uh, 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 Dr. Deborah Burks uh, will outline the data that we're seeing around the country. We're tracking literally state by state, uh, county by county. Uh, but as she will describe in a moment, we're actually seeing early indications uh, of a percent of positive testing flattening in Arizona and Florida and Texas. Uh, governors in uh, each of those states have taken strong steps uh, to flatten the curve. And again, as Dr. Burks will describe, we're beginning to see early indications that positivity is flattening. And in Arizona and Florida, uh, we are beginning to see uh, declining numbers of emergency room visits as well. Uh, we believe the takeaway from this for every American, particularly in those states that are impacted, is, uh, is keep doing what you're doing uh, because we're starting to see uh, the first indications uh, that as we were able to do uh, in the Northeast, as we were able to do uh, in New Orleans and Louisiana and Michigan and other places around the country, we're putting into practice those mitigation efforts and we're beginning to see indications that they are having uh, a good effect. Uh, we are focused on the states where more than half of the new cases uh, uh, have arisen, Texas, Arizona, Florida, and California, and have received uh, uh, encouraging reports even through this morning. Strong supplies of PPE in hospitals, hospital capacity remains strong. The one need that we did hear uh, from governors across the region is for personnel. And over the last week, uh, working through FEMA, the Department of Defense, and HHS, we've been processing uh, requests to deploy uh, over 1,070 doctors and nurses and medical personnel. At this point, uh, roughly 525 doctors and nurses are on the ground in uh, Arizona, uh, California, and Texas. And we're processing uh, a request from Florida for an additional amount. Um, We've made it very clear, as, as we, if you'll recall, we deployed uh, at the President's direction active duty military medical personnel to New York, to New Jersey, to Connecticut, to Michigan, to Louisiana, uh, and we're in the process of doing that again, just to make sure that, uh, that those dedicated doctors and nurses and healthcare workers uh, have the relief that they need uh, as we see cases uh, rising in various communities across uh, the Sun Belt, and we'll continue to work that. Uh, we had uh, a conference call yesterday with the nation's governors. Uh, we are in the process of uh, continuing to send every week a detailed county-by-county county summaries, analysis, and recommendations to governors that are being, uh, that are being implemented and well-received. Uh, we also are issuing uh, renewed guidance on uh, preservation and reuse of PPE. Again, uh, what we're hearing, and not just speaking to governors, but talking directly to hospitals, is that, uh, frankly, because of the historic effort that President Trump implemented, the spin up hundreds of millions of supplies of gloves and 
and masks and face shields and as well as uh, uh, the construction of ventilators. We now have 59,000 ventilators in our supplies. PPE, we hear, remains very strong, but we're encouraging uh, healthcare workers to begin now to use some of the best practices that we learned in other parts of the country to, uh, uh, to preserve and to reuse uh, the PPE supplies. Uh, so our, our focus is to make sure our states have uh, everything they need uh, when they need it, and we're working closely with all the governors to make that a reality. But what brings us to the Department of Education is uh, as we as we see to the needs of our states, as we focus on the health care of the American people, we're working to reopen America and to reopen America's schools. And yesterday, President Trump convened a summit of education leaders and health officials uh, at the White House. Uh, and as the President made clear yesterday, um, it's time. Uh, it's time for us to get our kids back to school. And uh, the summit yesterday uh, gave us an opportunity to to uh, outline and to learn uh, what we might be able to do that. In just a few moments, I'm going to ask Secretary DeVos to talk about the approach the Department of Education is taking to assisting local communities and states in bringing their schools back online. And also, we'll hear from Dr. Bob Redfield, who, who uh, has been literally since early in this pandemic uh, providing guidance to schools and will be issuing additional guidance next week. I wouldn't want to pass the opportunity, though. Uh, not just as vice president, but as, uh, uh, as someone who's been married to a school teacher now for 35 years, just to say, uh, to say thank you to all the teachers out there. Um, uh, from early in this pandemic, and teachers uh, learned how to do the distance teaching and did a remarkable job, um, oftentimes having to care for their own families and make sure their own children's uh, studies were happening. So to all of our America's teachers, we say thank you. We also want to say thank you to the parents, uh, the parents who had to step in and, and become educators for all of their kids. It's really been remarkable when you see what our kids have been able to accomplish uh, during this difficult time. Uh, but what we heard again uh, yesterday from education officials and, and what we heard from the American Academy of Pediatrics, um, it's absolutely essential that we get our kids back into classroom uh, for in-person learning. We can't let our kids fall behind academically, uh, but it's important that the American people uh, remember uh, that, uh, that for uh, children that, that have mental health issues, for special needs children, uh, for nutrition, for uh, children in, in uh, uh, communities facing persistent poverty, the school is the place where they receive all those services. And so this is not just simply about making sure our kids are learning and they're advancing academically, but, but, but for their mental health, for their well-being, for their physical health, for nutrition. We've got to get our kids back to school. Uh, and as, as you heard the president yesterday uh, uh, and even again this morning, we're absolutely determined uh, to work in partnership with our states uh, to give the guidance uh, for states and communities to be able to safely reopen our schools. Um, the CDC will be issuing new guidance uh, next week, uh, uh, part of a five-part uh, series of uh, recommendations uh, that will give all new tools uh, to our schools. But what uh, Dr. Redfield made clear yesterday, I'm sure he'll make clear again today, is we're here to help. We don't want uh, federal guidance to be uh, a substitute uh, for state and local laws and rules and guidance. We, uh, we're here to assist with the shared objective that I think is shared by every parent in America, which is we want to get our kids back. We want to get them back in the classroom. We want to get our teachers back in the front of those classrooms. We want to get our kids learning in person uh, once again. Um, uh, as Congress uh, is uh, still in recess, but we'll gather again soon, we already are in discussions about additional potential support, although we were able to remind governors that $13.3 billion uh, is available in the CARES Act for states uh, to be able to assist them as they roll out uh, and restart schools across the country. Uh, at the present moment, we learned yesterday that only 1.5% of those funds has been drawn down by states, and we encouraged governors to take advantage of that. Uh, our objectives, are, as I said, are to save lives, meet the needs of our states and their health care workers, protect the most vulnerable, 
uh, and safely reopen America and safely reopen our schools. Uh, and the good news is we are, we are reopening America. The jobs report last Thursday spoke for itself, nearly five million jobs created. And I can tell you, evidence all around the country is that the American people are finding a way to do their part, uh, to put the health of their neighbors first, even while we all find a way to get back to work, to worship, uh, and to school. And we all have a role to play uh, to slow the spread, to protect uh, the most vulnerable, and to safely reopen uh, our country uh, and our schools. And so I would just... Uh, uh, I would just close before I turn the podium over to Dr. Burks for her report, just simply to say thank you to the American people. Thank you for what you've done so far. Thank you for the way you've put the health and well-being uh, of not just family members and, and friends, but, but, uh, but strangers, people you didn't even know first. And we just encourage you to keep doing what you're doing. Keep heeding the guidance of state and local authorities. Practice good hygiene. Wash your hands. Wear a mask wherever a state and local authorities determine it's indicated, or wear a mask where you can't engage in social distancing. This is the role each of us can continue to play, and we're seeing some early indications in some of the most impacted states that Americans are doing just that. So we want to encourage you on and tell you that we're going to continue to do our part. And I'm just absolutely confident, just as we proved when this pandemic was striking uh, so deeply in the Northeast when it was striking in the Louisiana and in Michigan. The American people know what needs to be done, and um, we know we can do it. And we flattened, we flattened the curve before. We slowed the spread before, uh, and we can do it again. But we've got to all do our part, and we'll do it together. With that, uh, Dr. Deborah Burks, and, uh, and then we'll get a report from Admiral Girard before we move on to other reports. Dr. Burks. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. If I could have the first slide, please. Um, and I, I know some of you do watch what I wear, so I'm wearing this specially today. Um, this came from the Salt River Tribe. I just want to, mass can be a fashion statement. And I want to thank the Salt River Tribe. It was a real pleasure to be out um, and speaking to individuals around the United States about the issues that they're facing with COVID-19, to be able to meet with communities, hospital personnel, African-American communities, Hispanic communities, and our pride tribal nations. Um, that was a privilege last week. I want to start with Arizona, um, just to pick up where the vice president left off. That orange line is the number of tests performed, and the blue line is the test positivity. Now, this is a, at the level of the state. Um, and Arizona does have three counties that we're tracking very closely. Obviously, you know the largest one being Phoenix and Maricopa County. But this dish does show that the blue line, which is a five-day, a seven-day average, and thank you to the data team for these wonderful slides, the, the seven-day average is showing some flattening, and they find that encouraging, also equally encouraging at this point, because we know that the test positivity rate is the first thing to increase, um, and we're hoping that it heralds a stability in Arizona of at least reaching a plateau in their curve. The red line represents the emergency room visits, for any of the COVID-like symptoms. Um, and this is also an early indicator, um, and we find that encouraging. The next slide does show the counties that we're tracking, obviously the largest county being Maricopa County with the largest number of infections, but clearly there's issues in Yuma and Pima. Um, the Vice President mentioned the weekly reports that go to governors. This is what the report um, looks like. Of course, they're full side pages. Um, this is Alaska's. On the front page is our interpretation of what we're seeing relevant to their epidemic um, with specific recommendations related to where we see them as far as being in a danger zone. Um, they are coded by yellow and red. And it follows that they see um, everything you're seeing on that first report in boxes, warning boxes, and then um, each of the counties are represented so that they have in one place five pages from the White House and task force that summarizes what we're seeing and that goes out weekly. Um, next slide, please. This looks at Florida and you can see uh, in the same way the red line early suggestions of decreasing emergency room visits for the symptoms of COVID. 
and some stability starting in that blue line, hoping that heralds a stability in the number of daily reported cases. We also understand that we went through a holiday weekend, and holiday weekends can impact data on both ends, under-reporting through the weekend, and then catch-up reporting on um, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday after holiday weekend. Next slide, this shows the counties of Florida that we're tracking. These are the top 10 counties in Florida, and you can see each of them have a different profile. I want to call your attention to the counties that are across the bottom there that are more difficult to see. Some of those represent um, Jacksonville and our other large metros, including Tampa. When the governor talks about how they were steady and low for a long period of time after reopening, this is where that is reflected for almost five weeks after reopening. Clearly, there was something that happened, though, and those that we're looking into across the board, because whatever happened in Florida happened across the Sun Belt, and that all of the curves and all of the findings are mirrored. If you remember early on in March and April, um, we were talking about First, the, the New York Metro, followed by Boston, followed by Philadelphia, then Chicago, and New Orleans was with um, the New York Metro. And so it was a series of individual curves. In this case, whatever occurred, occurred almost simultaneously across the South. And so we're investigating that very closely to really see the etiology behind that, because that can help us as an early warning si signal, but also help us in guidance to the American people of what we're asking them to do. Next slide, Texas. And you can see Texas is in a similar situation with their blue line, um, and we're watching this very closely across Texas. Next slide. But I think all of you know that there's a series of major metros in Texas with significant um, increase in cases from Houston to Dallas to San Antonio to El Paso um, and McClellan area. And so the governors get this type of report um, with specific recommendations. And then finally, California, where you can see, um, next slide, thank you. Um, again, a long time of stability, but then this increase in the number of test positives and rapid increase in cases. Next slide. And you can see the majority of the issue is in the Los Angeles area, although we see this through Riverside, Imperial, Sacramento, and now San Francisco with increased number of cases. So I want to finish with where the vice president started about the sacrifices of the American people, because in that recommendations are very clear recommendations that when you have a county with these types of cases, we are recommending everyone using a face covering. And I think the studies now that have been done showing that cotton face coverings um, work, that does open up the ability for us all to have individualized face coverings that express our personality. But in addition, I think the work that these governors have done to um, and ask the American people to stop going to bars, to close the bars, to move to outdoor dining, to decrease indoor, any kind of indoor gatherings, again, to all of the Americans out there that are in these four states and the states that have, in the report, we're in the red zone because there's a series of other states that we have in that zone, is really asking the American people in those counties and in those states, in those states to not only use the face coverings, not going to bars, not going to indoor dining, but really not gathering in homes either and decreasing those gatherings back down to our phase one recommendation, which was 10 or less. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Adam, report on testing. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. Um, since we're bragging on our face coverings, um, this was made by a small religious community in Pennsylvania um, who, who were helped by the Public Health Service, and they hand sewed these for a lot of our officers to match our uh, operational dress, those blue uniforms. So I wear this proudly, and I think of that community every single day everybody pitching in across America to help us all. So in terms of testing, I want to cover three quick topics. First one is just where we are numerically. Vice President has already said <clears throat> we are now topping 39 million tests across the country. Um, the states really crushed their goal in June. Uh, the state goals was about 12.9 million in June. Uh, CDC numbers uh, have finalized that at about 16 and a half 
million tests for June. So congratulations to almost all of the states who uh, made their goal, exceeded their goal. Uh, we're doing very well right now, between six and 700,000 tests per day. We did top the 700,000 mark uh, last week, and we're averaging about, about 620, 630,000 tests per day. We continue to ship. Um, we are ripe with swabs and media, so the states tell us what they need. We work with them to set those goals based on their state testing plans. Uh, after technical assistance by the CDC and my office, FEMA ships those every week. Uh, now that's along with ASPR, uh, the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response um, at HHS. So that's sort of the overall general view. Uh, we announced yesterday uh, what we talked about a little bit last week, and that is federal surge sites. Um, we opened these in three communities. Uh, there was a list of communities identified by Dr. Burks and her team that had certain characteristics of their infection trend, but also met certain characteristics of uh, numerical numbers and isolation that uh, surge testing uh, might have an impact over a short period of time. So our goal in those communities is to do at least 5,000 tests per day, um, and those are in Baton Rouge, Jacksonville, and McAllen, uh, the McAllen in Texas. Um, and we have uh, many other sites uh, that we're working with. Again, this is a partnership uh, with the state and local governments to make that happen. Um, they're up and running and testing on all three sites. Uh, Baton Rouge started yesterday. The other two sites start today, and we already have uh, almost 6,500 appointments already made this morning. So that's going very, very well. The last thing I want to talk about is Phoenix. Um, and I don't know if we have the slides for this. Um, I, I get just a little bit concerned when I hear things in the news like we're doing nothing for Phoenix and the federal government hasn't been doing anything with Phoenix because that really is not correct and it undermines a lot of the things that we're doing. I'm going to show you some slides. I didn't make these slides up. My team, this was part of a 55 slide deck, 55 slide slide deck just on Phoenix where we understand the demographics, the health disparities, the income levels. Um, the racial and ethnicity backgrounds, where the tests are done, where the resources are. This is how we really work the issues. So first of all, we're in constant contact with Governor Ducey and his team. Uh, his state health officials uh, are outstanding. Uh, we not only talk on the calls, but we have frequent calls. And I know uh, Dr. Redfield does this as well, and Ambassador Burks does this as well. Number two, we provide support according to the state plans. Uh, just in the last two months, we've shipped over 500,000 um, swabs uh, and media to the state to, to fulfill their plans. Um, in terms of Phoenix, if I can get the first slide back, please. Um, I just want to say that, yes, we have lots of support in Phoenix. Uh, uh, this is the community-based testing locations. I didn't decode this because it's right out of my slide deck. Um, Phoenix has three federally funded retail sites. This is uh, paid on a per capita basis. You come up, get a test. These sites, not these three sites, but this overall program has tested just under a million individuals, and they're located specifically in communities of high social vulnerability. We have three there. We also have 13 uh, what we call 3.0 sites. These are retail pharmacies that, because of our regulatory flexibility, they can do that without a federal stipend or grant. They do this just through the insurance, Medicare, and Medicaid billing system. So those are 16 federal sites we have in Phoenix. Next slide. Um, I don't know if there's a map to go with that, but under the leadership of Secretary Azar, we've really surged into FQHCs, uh, Federally Qualified Health Centers. Um, this is where you really want testing to happen because these are medical homes for those who are indigent and underserved. We have 28 FQHC sites performing testing just in the, just in the Phoenix area um, right now. Next slide. We don't have that slide, but let me talk about, um, we've also identified every single testing machine in Phoenix. So there are uh, testing machines to do tens of thousands of tests per day, and we're sending at least 100,000, okay, maybe it'll come up, maybe it won't, but at least 100,000 assays to the Phoenix area every week. So these are all the things we're doing in the background that, that happen on a regular basis that we do community by community by community. Now, two days ago, um, I heard that uh, Mayor Gallego was unhappy because there was no federal support. I heard that uh, on, Monday, on Monday morning. I was on the phone with the FEMA representative in the afternoon. It was clear to me that Phoenix was not in tune with all the things that the state were doing. We convened a call last night where we had Governor Ducey's uh, people on the phone. 
where we had the mayor's people on the phone, where we had various health officials on the phone. We got everybody together, understood where the gaps are. There's a surge from Arizona State. There are a surge in testing sites that are state testing sites in Phoenix that are up there. Uh, and this morning, Governor Ducey looked at everything, thought a surge site would be helpful in West Phoenix. He requested that, and we're contracting that right now. So I just wanted to give you that example because it really pains me when somebody says the federal government isn't doing anything when we have 41 federal sites there. We're sending supplies, we're sending tests, and we work with the governor every day. And if there's an appropriate request and it's on the list for Dr. Burks, which it was, we will send a surge site, and that's what we're doing. We're contracting that this afternoon. Thank you. Good job. Uh, thank you, Admiral Girard. Uh, uh, as we said, the focus today is on safely reopening our schools. And uh, as we discussed yesterday at the uh, White House summit, uh, from very early in this process, the Centers for Disease Control has been issuing guidance for schools and for child care services in uh, early March, um, March the 12th to be specific. And uh, uh, when we first published the 15 days to slow the spread and encourage people to engage uh, in uh, schooling from home wherever possible. Uh, from that point forward, uh, CDC has published decision trees about how schools can begin to develop reopening plans and just last week published new guidance for K-12 schools. Uh, but next week, um, as uh, uh, Dr. Redfield uh, can elaborate, uh, in a few moments they'll be issuing five new documents uh, that'll range from preparing communities to return to school safely to decision-making tools for parents and caregivers, and uh, to create uh, symptom screening considerations as, as children and teachers uh, return uh, to school. Uh, but uh, as uh, we made clear yesterday, we'll make clear again today, we're here to help. Um, and none of the CDC's recommendations are intended to replace state, local rules and guidance. Uh, that what we've made clear to governors and to state uh, and local health officials is CDC stands ready uh, to work uh, with local officials as they tailor their plan for reopening their schools. Uh, but uh, we're all committed to getting our kids back in the classroom uh, and getting them back in the classroom this fall. With that, I want the Secretary of Education to reflect on, um, on uh, the efforts she's making here at the Department of Education that we'll hear from Dr. Redfield, and then a few uh, wrap-up comments from Secretary of HHS before we go to questions. Madam Secretary. Thanks, Mr. Thank you so much, Mr. Vice President. Thanks for hosting the uh, task force here today. Uh, we are so grateful to the President and to you for your leadership on doing what's right for students. Uh, yesterday, we had a really good and important conversation at the White House with local leaders and great teachers and parents. It was insightful and inspiring. And as uh, Mrs. Pence noted, these past few months, parents have worn multiple hats. They really are our un unsung heroes. And I might add, uh, as uh, the Vice President noted, as are the teachers who were often playing dual roles as parents themselves and continuing to help their students learn. She also said, Mrs. Pence also said, that as we reopen businesses, restaurants, theaters in our country, we simply can't leave out our schools. And that is so correct. Students can and must continue to learn full time. I've been really inspired by the innovative teachers, schools, and their communities that have kept learning going through this past few months, and they're getting ready to do it again this fall. A couple of great examples in uh, Harlem and uh, the surrounding boroughs in New York, Success Academy moved to distance learning in one week using multiple technology platforms. Uh, teachers there insisted on in uh, learning new materials right along with their students. The students were still graded. They made sure all the students had the needed tech that they did not maybe have at home initially. Miami-Dade County used existing instructional continuity plans to make a seamless transition to distance learning. They added interventions for students who were struggling uh, already before the pandemic. The International Leadership Academy in Texas started from the mindset that not learning wasn't an option for any student. They delivered multilingual and special education curriculum to all of their students. There were a number of schools and districts across the country that did an awesome job of transitioning this spring. 
And there were a lot in which I and state school leaders were disappointed in that they didn't figure out how to continue to serve their students. Too many of them just gave up. Uh, the Center for Reinventing Public Education said that only 10% across the board provided any kind of real curriculum and instruction program. And as I said, I, I've talked to all of the state school chiefs at least once, most of them more than once, and they've told me that while many of their districts in their states have done well through the past several months, a number of them uh, they were very disappointed in, in doing next to nothing. And then uh, we see as we talk about reopening schools, uh, there are some creating false paradigms for the fall. And here, right in our neighborhood, the D.C. area, Fair Fairfax County, which is one of the most well-funded, uh, I would call it an elite public school system in America, um, offered families a so-called choice for this fall, either zero days in school for their students or two days. And their springtime uh, attempt at distance learning was a disaster. But I have to I, I give this as an example because things like this cannot happen again in the fall. It would fail America's students and it would fail taxpayers who pay high taxes for their education. Ultimately, it's not a matter of if schools should reopen, it's simply a matter of how. Mm -hmm. They must fully open and they must be fully operational. And how that happens is best left to education and community leaders. I really appreciate something that Secretary Azar reiterated yesterday at the White House. It's the Surgeon General's prescription for health care. And I'm going to repeat it again because it bears uh, repeating. First, ask yourself, what's your individual circumstance? Are you or is someone in your home vulnerable? Second, what's going on in your community? Is the virus widespread or is it isolated? And third, think about the kind of school activity that you're talking, that you're thinking about how to, how to accommodate and deal with. What needs to be in place for things to be successful? Education leaders need to examine real data for their own states and communities and weigh the risks. Local leaders in every community need to ask these questions and consider all the risks. Physical health and safety are factors. So is mental health so is social emotional development. And importantly, very importantly, so are lost opportunities for students, particularly the most vulnerable among us and students with disabilities. The American Academy of Pediatrics noted, keeping schools closed places children and adolescents at considerable risk of morbidity and in some cases mortality. The pediatrics guidance concluded that everyone should start with a goal of having students physically present in school. Fully open and fully operational means that students need a full school year or more, and it's expected it will look different depending on where you are. What's clear is that students and their families need more options. I've talked a long time about the need to rethink education and the, to expand education options for all students. This moment really demands action, and America always was and is and always will be a country of doers. We are confident that with grit and determination and a measure of grace, we can and will do what's right for all the students in our nation. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Vice President. First and foremost, I want to make it very, very clear that the guidance that CDC continues to put out for schools K through 12 and higher learning is intentional for reopening and keeping our schools open. That it's, that's its purpose. We recognize that there's a variety of unique circumstances for different schools and different school districts. And so we've outlined a number of strategies that those schools, those administrators can use to accomplish this goal safely. But I want to make it very clear that what is not the intent of CDC's guidelines is to be used as a rationale to keep schools closed. We're prepared to work with each school, each jurisdiction to help them use the different strategies that we propose that help do this safely 
So they come up with the optimal strategy for those schools. I think it's critical, and it would be personally very disappointing to me, and I know my agency, if we saw that individuals were using these guidelines as a rationale for not reopening our schools. I think there's a series of uh, different uh, additional guidelines that we are uh, uh, about to put out to help really uh, with the K-12 community, uh, particularly at the community level uh, to help open safely. Uh, guidelines also that come out or consideration documents for parents and caregivers. Uh, guidelines for schools to help them understand how best to do uh, symptom uh, surveillance and characterize symptoms in the schools as a tool and guidelines to really work at how and the ins and outs of using face mask in the school setting as well as finally some guidance and to help the schools uh, have systems which they can monitor their programs. But I want to close by just reiterating again that the purpose of CDC's guidance is, remember, it's guidance, it's not requirements, and its purpose is to facilitate the reopening and the keeping open the schools in this country. Because as, as the Vice President said, it is critical that we get these schools open, do it safely, we're prepared to work with all the school districts and schools to help them facilitate their development of their own unique plan to accomplish that. Thank you. Thanks, Dr. Redfield. Opening up schools is the right thing to do for our kids so they don't fall behind academically and also so that children that are in need of services, special needs children, children with mental health issues, nutrition needs, have the support that they receive at the schools. Uh, it's important, though, for parents and for working families. And we, I asked Secretary uh, Scalia to be here from the Department of Labor to speak about the impact on, on as we put America back to work, making it possible for us to have, uh, have single parents back in the workforce. It's, it's essential that we get our schools open as well. And so I wanted Secretary Scalia and then, of course, Secretary of HHS to finish our remarks before we go to questions. Mr. Secretary. Thank you. <clears throat> Mr. Vice President, it's good to be with you all today. Um, for reasons that uh, Secretary DeVos has mentioned, that the Vice President mentioned, of course, having our schools uh, open uh, is so important to our children's education. But as the Vice President has said, uh, it's very important as well to uh, working men and women across the country who uh, need to be able to structure uh, their work days in a uh, predictable manner uh, in the expectation that schools will be open and their children will be able to be in school so that the parents in turn can have a predictable schedule that they bring to the workplace. Of course, that's uh, important to uh, our business places as well. And in that sense, it's really critically important to our uh, national reopening. One study has suggested that if we uh, closed all our schools and daycare for just a month, just hypothetical, if we, if we did that, the impact on U.S. productivity would be uh, on the order of $50 billion. It gives you some sense of the impact uh, having our schools closed can have on our national recovery. I did want to mention a couple of groups in particular to whom this is uh, very important. First, uh, lower wage workers. One of the great uh, triumphs of the economy that we enjoyed until uh, the virus came was how well uh, lower income uh, men and women were doing in the workplace. We, as you know, had uh, unemployment the tide of 50-year low. Uh, we had record low unemployment for African Americans, Hispanic Americans, and others. And, uh, and we had rising wages. Wages uh, actually rose about 15 percent for lower income uh, men and women uh, during the first three years of this administration. Unfortunately, and a, a number of people have observed this, it's the lower income workers who've been uh, particularly adversely affected by some of the shutdowns that we've had uh, in response to the uh, coronavirus. Uh, uh, unemployment among the uh, lower income uh, workers has been uh, higher uh, than for other populations. And therefore, uh, for them, uh, having schools reopen uh, so that they can uh, themselves have predictable schedules, be able to return to the workplace, is going to be very important. They hold jobs that are 
uh, less likely to be jobs uh, by which you can telecommute. I think uh, many of us know that even telecommuting, there are burdens being placed on mothers, fathers who are getting up a little bit earlier or staying up a lot later uh, to get work done to plan around uh, caring for their children in the interim. But for lower income uh, men and women, uh, that option often is not even available. And then second, uh, let me comment briefly on working women who uh, studies show, and I think uh, experience of many of us reflects that it's uh, women in the household who uh, quite often uh, bear the larger uh, burden when it comes to uh, caring for children. Studies show this. And, uh, and, and again, uh, it, prior to COVID, another great success of the economy we were enjoying was the employment rate for women. Uh, the unemployment rate for women was actually lower than for men uh, right before the virus came. But uh, unfortunately, and this is a statistic we've been tracking, we see that the unemployment rate for women now is, is higher uh, than it is uh, for men. Now, we made great progress in June. The Vice President mentioned the Extraordinary Jobs Report. Uh, we've put 7.5 million Americans back to work uh, in just two months. And the unemployment rate, rate for women dropped uh, nearly 3 percent in June. But still, we, we have uh, important work to do, and we know that working women will have a harder time uh, getting back to the workplace. They continue to cite child care at a much higher rate than men. There was a reason that they're not able to work. Uh, and so for them, too, reopening our schools uh, will be very important. Um, let, just to wrap up, uh, in such an important sense, the pace and structure of our national life is built around the expectation that our young people uh, will be in school uh, in, in person uh, during the school year. That's so important for them, but it's also vitally important uh, for their parents, and in that sense, so critical to this reopening that uh, is proceeding very well economically. But to keep going, we need our schools open in the fall. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you, Gene. Mr. Secretary. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Vice President, for your leadership of the President's All of America approach to combating the virus and for the focus that you're now putting on getting our kids safely back to school. From HHS's perspective, reopening schools safely may be the single most important thing that we can do to support healthy families during this pandemic. All decisions about undertaking activities during COVID-19 have to look at risk as a continuum not a binary question. States and school districts can think about the same things that we urge individuals to think about. As Secretary DeVos noted, our Surgeon General has come out with his prescription for health. Ask yourself three critical questions. Where are you? Is there significant community transmission of the virus in your area? Whom are we talking about? Children are much, le much less susceptible to severe outcomes from the virus than adults. And what activities are we looking at? There are more and less risky activities for schools, like keeping kids in the same classroom versus changing classes, avoiding large gatherings, and doing activities outside whenever possible. Reopening schools comes with some risk, but there are risks to keeping kids at home, too. At home, kids aren't benefiting from social stimulation. They may be falling behind in learning. They may be more vulnerable to abuse that goes unreported by the mandatory reporters in our school system. They may not be getting special services they may need. They may not be getting the nutrition that they get at school. And it may be difficult for parents to get back to work, as Secretary Scalia noted. This issue, like so many considerations around safely reopening, isn't about health versus the economy, but about health versus health. All of this is why the American Academy of Pediatrics has strongly recommended beginning with the goal of having students physically present in school. This goal is the right way to use the extensive guidance that CDC has put out to help each state and school district think through a safe reopening. Last week, we put out guidance around testing for K through 12 schools. This guidance, like our guidance for colleges and universities, offers recommendations for how and when students, teachers, and staff should be tested. While CDC does not make a recommendation in favor of universal testing, it's a perfectly appropriate surveillance technique where the capacity exists and capacity is growing all the time. We've talked with colleges and universities that are able to use their research lab capacity 
with pooling of multiple samples to test their whole student bodies and staff frequently, thanks to regulatory flexibility that CMS and the FDA have provided. Many of the leaders we heard from yesterday at the White House School Reopening Summit are doing testing before returning to school and then sentinel surveillance. On top of that, the measures we recommend universally, like keeping a distance, wearing a face covering, and frequent hand washing, are effective and can be applied in the college or the K through 12 setting. We put out the CDC guidance to enable and support states and school districts in reopening safely. We want them to use the tools available to reduce risk, and we'll be putting out more guidance on how schools can use each of these tools, such as face coverings. On top of that, I will reiterate that our set of tools is expanding all of the time. Just yesterday, we signed a new agreement with Regeneron to provide nearly half a billion dollars in support for a promising therapeutic, all the way to manufacturing hundreds of thousands of doses for the American people. The initial doses, pending approval, would be available as soon as the end of this summer or early fall. That is the first of a number of therapeutic agreements that we will do under the President's Operation Warp Speed initiative. Promising therapeutics are already being administered every day by our heroic healthcare workers. I want to thank these heroes who continue to put themselves at risk, caring for those suffering from the virus. We know many frontline workers have gotten sick, and we know some have given their lives, including some of my employees in the Indian Health Service. And America is deeply grateful. It is because we are making progress against the virus and learning more about it every day that we can talk about how to bring America's kids and teachers back to school safely. We have the tools to do it, and it has to be a top priority. So thank you to President Trump and the Vice President for putting such a focus on this very important aspect of our road to recovery. Thank you. Thank you. Right here, please. Here we go. Mr. Vice President, um, in the President's call to reopen schools, is there a situation in some states that the health situation doesn't allow for this, where you would be supportive of some states continuing distance learning? And we now see the President threatening to cut off funding for schools. Is that a serious threat, and what would that look like? Well, the, the principle behind our approach to this coronavirus pandemic has been to uh, provide federal support as, as states manage their own response. And uh, what I can tell you is in the weekly reports that we provide governors, we're, we're down to the county level in terms of where the new cases are, where the positivity lies. Um, and I, I think we would account for the fact uh, that while we hope, uh, we hope every school in America is able to open uh, this fall, there may be some uh, states and local communities that, that given cases or positivity in that community may adjust to either a certain set of days or certain limitations. And we'll be very respectful of that. What the President's made clear, though, is that we think it's absolutely imperative uh, that every state and territory in this country uh, make, uh, uh, make uh, steps and take steps, rather, to get kids back in the classroom to the fullest extent possible. Um, we really believe that, uh, that every state has the ability to do that, uh, but for those individual communities that may be seeing uh, outbreaks, uh, we'll work with them, give them the guidance uh, and the support uh, to be able to implement the policies that they deem are most appropriate. Our, our mission here is to safely reopen our schools, uh, and as you've heard from all, all of these members of our task force, it's, it's not just about kids learning and not falling behind academically. It's about all the vital services that children receive at our schools. It's about working families. It's about opening up America again. And so we'll continue to drive on that. On your second point, I, I would tell you that at this point, uh, I think 90% of education funding comes from the states, roughly 10%, depending on states' budgets, come from the federal government. Uh, and as we work with Congress on uh, the next round of uh, state support, uh, we're going to be looking for ways uh, to give states um, uh, a strong incentive and an encouragement to get kids back to school. Please, go ahead. 
Mr. Vice President. Uh, the President tweeted this morning that he disagrees with the CDC's very tough and expensive guidelines for reopening schools. Do you also disagree with those guidelines? And are you concerned that you may be putting the health of students and teachers at risk by trying to meet the President's demand to reopen? Well, the President and I spoke about that uh, this morning, and um, I think uh, what you will see in the coming days, what you heard from Dr. Redfield yesterday at the summit and again today is very consistent uh, with the President's objective and the concerns that he's raised. We, we don't want uh, the guidance from CDC to be a reason why schools don't open. Uh, we want to partner with states, uh, with local education officials, with governors, with local health officials to find a way to meet their needs to open up. And I think the President's uh, uh, statement this morning was simply reflective of that desire, uh, and but we remain very confident that as we continue to provide resources, we're seeing not just not just K through 12 education. I mean, all 47 states uh, and two territories have already published plans and guidance for reopening their schools. And we reiterated to the governors earlier this week and again uh, at the summit yesterday that we're really here to partner with them to achieve that. And I think what the president was saying this morning is that if there are aspects of the CDC's recommendations that are prescriptive or that serve to as a, as a barrier to kids getting back to school, we, 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 want, uh, we want governors and, and local officials and education leaders to know that we're here to work with them uh, to support the measures they're putting into place. But I, I, I think that every American Every American knows that we can safely reopen our schools, and uh, we just want we want uh, we want to we want, as the president said this morning, to make sure that what we're doing doesn't stand in the way of doing that. Can I just follow up on that, sir? Go ahead. Um, just to follow up, when we're talking about the health of children, though, shouldn't the guidance be tough, and should no expense be spared? Well, I, I'm going to ask Bob Redfield to speak to that. And one of the things that we we have seen, and I, and I tell you, as a as a parent, as much as your vice president and the head of this task force, I've been um, I've been grateful for it. Is that that apart from having a, an underlying health condition, children do not appear to be susceptible to serious illness from the coronavirus. Um, Dr. Burks can speak to that statistically on a global basis, and that's been a blessing uh, for Americans and American families. Um, and, and so, w as, this, as Secretary Azar just said, we know that the risk of serious illness uh, to children is very low, and there are measures we can put into place to make sure that we don't, we don't see the, uh, uh, the spread of a virus or outbreaks in individual schools by having children learn in a single classroom or learn outside as often as possible and not go into larger settings. And this is all the kind of guidance that the CDC is putting forward. Uh, but um, but I, I'm going to let uh, Bob Redfield speak to that because um, um, we, we really do believe that we can open these schools safely um, given the, the, uh, what we have seen in terms of uh, outcomes among children. Uh, and, uh, and also uh, uh, the kind of measures that we think we can put into effect to, to prevent the spread. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. I think it's really important to be clear that uh, uh, our recommendations to open these schools are really based on the sound public health uh, and safety and health of children. I think you heard already from some of the speakers, there's substantial health consequences that we've seen as a consequence of schools uh, being closed, whether it's access to mental health services or it's access to nutrition. Um, clearly, uh, we know a lot, and I think it's important that we don't react emotionally, but we act based on data. Uh, clearly, the ability of this virus to cause significant illness in children is very, 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 very limited. We know of the post-immune inflammatory disease that you've heard about, but it's very rare. But in general, this virus does not cause significant illness in children. Secondly, and I think it's important, unlike influenza, where one of our biggest concerns is we've been able to show that it's really schools and children that become the instrument of transmission 
throughout our community with influenza, we really don't have evidence that children are driving the transmission cycle of this. The most important thing as we reopen schools, and as I mentioned before, we're prepared to work with every school and every school district to help them find the right mixture of strategies for them to do this safely. Our recommendations are not requirements and they're not meant to be prescriptive. We have lots of different options on how the schools can put it together. But what we do want to reiterate as we reopen schools is to remember the importance of protecting the vulnerable. That we will be strong on. It's important to limit the ability of individuals with significant comorbidities, uh, individuals that happen to be elderly with comorbidities. Uh, we want to limit those individuals, their interactions in general in society, independent of the schools. Thanks, Bob. Now, let me say just also in response to your question, I would recommend that every American uh, review the statement uh, issued by the um, uh, American Academy of Pediatrics uh, that, uh, that released an important report indicating that there are real uh, physical and, and mental cause for children to be deprived of, uh, of an in-classroom setting. Uh, ranges from nutrition to children that have special needs. Uh, we, we heard from uh, 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 Dr. McCants Katz that some seven million children in America uh, deal with mental health issues and the services and the counseling they receive, they receive at their schools. And so w we want to put the health and well-being of our kids first. And given the fact that children, as Dr. Redfield said again, do not appear to be susceptible to serious outcomes, from the, from the coronavirus. Uh, we want to put their, the totality of their health and their well-being forward. And that all tells us, it tells the president, tells this task force, that means we need to get our kids back to school. Please. President, thank you. Um, articulated the, the problem, the myriad risks that students face if they stay out of school come the fall. Mm -hmm. But what's the plan? What's the administration's specific plan in terms of increased testing, contact tracing, increased PPE if it's needed to support these schools. As you well know, schools weren't built for students to socially distance. They were built to pack in as many kids as humanly possible, which is one of the reasons why school districts like Fairfax, Virginia, the school district in New York or Texas, they have moved to this hybrid approach, some virtual learning, some in-person learning. So what's, what's the plan? And then I have a question for Dr. Burks about kids and COVID, if I may. Well, the plan is to continue to do what we have done from the very beginning. Uh, as you heard again this morning, we're, uh, we're at, I believe, uh, 39 million tests that have been uh, performed all across this country. Um, you heard uh, Admiral Girard describe the extraordinary commitment in just one community alone. And what we've conveyed to governors is whatever support they need to get kids back to school, we're going to make sure that they have. Uh, we're going to make sure that they have the testing resources. Uh, we're currently uh, educating uh, states on the possibility and working with commercial labs on the possibility of what's called pooling uh, so that literally there could be one test run on say 10 samples and and there are there are particularly universities that already have built into their plans the idea of testing all of their students at the beginning of the academic year and then doing surveillance testing but we made it very clear whether it's testing whether it's personal protective equipment uh, or other resources uh, that that um, uh, we, we stand ready uh, to provide those resources to the states, and, um, um, and uh, we reiterated that once again uh, to the governors. Um, but um, the good news is, because of the historic mobilization that President Trump initiated, uh, we literally have hundreds of millions of supplies of personal protective equipment, 59,000 ventilators in the strategic national stockpile, uh, testing is scaling uh, all across America, and uh, we know that come the school year, we'll, we'll be ready to meet those needs. But question. Dr. Brooks, what's the infection rate among children, and what's the very latest in terms of, that you know, in terms of how the virus presents in children, how children transmit the virus to, to older adults? Nearly a third of teachers across this country are age 50 and older. And what's the best practice in terms of testing children? I've never heard of a case where a school child is tested for COVID-19? Those are all good questions, and I think it really comes to the, the evidence base of what do we have as far as testing in children. 
So if you look across all of the tests that we've done and whether we, when we have the age, the portion that has been the lowest tested portion is the under 10 year olds. So we're putting into place other ways to get testing results from them and looking at antibody in that discarded samples and try to fairly figure this out because parents have really done an amazing job of protecting their children. I think Americans have done a great job in keeping infection rates low in children and in the sheltering time and keeping infection rates r right now in this new cases. Originally, I think we saw great protection of people with comorbidities. We are worried now that as cases spread that it's getting to the older parents and the grandparents. And I call on, again, every multi-generational household get tested and protect those in the household. And we do know that there are children with vulnerabilities. And certainly within the CDC plan and Department of Education, it's protecting those children also from getting exposed to the virus. Because we do know there are children with comorbidities. We know that there are children in America with cancer and getting undergoing chemotherapy. But when you ask that question, the parents have so protected their children. And remember early on, we said test if you have symptoms. And now we know that if you're under 18, the majority of you don't have symptoms. And so really figuring out, and there's universities working around the country on a saliva test. So it would be easy, easier for children to put saliva in a tube, just basically what we call spitting in a tube, or spitting through a straw into a tube, um, and looking at that kind of innovation and testing. And what Admiral Girard has been working on very hard is this antigen-based testing and getting that equipment into both vulnerable areas like nursing homes, assisted living, um, and other places, but also considering how a school district could use that would make it much easier to test and to use saliva. So all of those are being worked on, and it's why we've been pushing on the antigen test. I know you heard me talk about that in April. Um, we're pushing on that because we think it is important for testing of students and testing in universities. But we have the... Our data is skewed originally to people with symptoms and then skewed to adults over 18. And so we are looking very closely into that category by using our antibody tests. Did you want to talk about the oh, I think the vice president covered that incredibly well. We know that mortality rate in under 25 from the CDC data is less than 0.1%. Um, and so that has been holding. But until we know how many have been infected, we have no evidence that there is significant mortality in children without coexisting diseases. Um, and that's what we're looking for right now, is to really make sure we've overturned every rock and understand that in deep detail. Yeah, right here, my mic. Mr. Vice President, uh, we all know the CDC guidelines are not requirements, they're advice. And isn't the president, when he calls it too tough or impractical, um, making it easier for Americans and for school officials to ignore that advice? Well, I, I, uh, I have every confidence that governors and, and uh, state education officials and local health officials are going to implement the policies that they think are in the best interest of children and families. And uh, I think the president's sentiment this morning, I think, is, uh, is, is shared widely by the American people and certainly uh, by members of this task force. We, we want to make it very clear uh, that, <coughs> that <coughs> excuse me, the guidance that we're issuing uh, is, is not to supplant uh, the laws, the rules, the regulation, or the decisions at the state level. It's meant to create uh, essentially a range of options uh, and what we made clear to governors uh, on the governor's call this week specifically was that we are prepared at the CDC uh, to sit down with state officials and to work through their plan uh, and, and uh, be able to advise and, uh, and dialogue with them about, about the best way forward. But I, I, I must tell you that uh, in this role over the last four months, I've, um, uh, I've been impressed uh, by... Uh, um, uh, governors in both political parties um, and um, health officials in all of our states and our territories with the way they put the health of their people first. And, but I, I must also say that I, I have a, a great sense talking to governors and a great sense uh, that this is a, 
something the American people want to see happen, and governors are hearing that. They know that, and that's why you have 47 states that have already issued plans or guidelines, and uh, we're going to work with them to make those a reality. Last question, guys. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Vice President. I have two questions, one for you and then one for Dr. Redfield. Can you explain why the president is threaten threatening to cut funding from schools at a time when educators are saying they need more so they can safely reopen? Caitlin, first and foremost, it's what you heard from the president is just a determination uh, to provide the kind of leadership from the federal level that says that we're going to get our kids back to school because that's where they belong. And, and we know based upon um, what, what our best health officials tell us that we can do that in a safe and in a responsible way. Um, but uh, to be clear, the, the current CARES Act provided $13.3 billion to support uh, education efforts in states in the midst of the pandemic. We're going to work with Congress. We expect there'll be additional support there. But um, the president's just very serious for all the reasons that we discussed today. Um, he believes, and we believe, it's absolutely essential for our children's academic development and, and for their social and emotional and health and nutrition needs to be back in the classroom. And, and we're going to provide the leadership uh, from the federal level to do that. But that being said, I, I will tell you, I, I sense a great uh, desire uh, among governors around the country to find a way forward, uh, and we've made it very clear to them that we're going to partner with them, providing them with the resources to impact that, and also the supplies. Well, you're saying it's a, describing it as a local decision, so shouldn't it be up to them to decide if they can safely reopen and not the president saying he's going to pressure them to do so? Well, I, I look, we're, we're going to respect those unique communities that may have challenges, that have rising cases or rising positivity. And, um, um, but I think you look at the nation as a whole. I think what the President of the United States has made clear is he thinks as we reopen America, we need to reopen America's schools. It's just as the President said early in this pandemic that he wanted to get our places of worship back open again. I think what you're seeing the President provide is, is leadership. Uh, and uh, what we're providing from the White House Coronavirus Task Force uh, is partnership uh, with the governors and with state health officials because um, we just got to get we got to get our kids back. I I, uh, I have to tell you the the best expert I know on this topic is my wife Karen, and uh, she spoke at the summit yesterday very compellingly um, uh, about how a lot of our kids are hurting out there. Uh, they're struggling with loneliness, with social isolation. Uh, the American Academy of, of Pediatrics spoke about that, a very forceful statement from pediatricians across the country that said, we've got to get our kids back into school. And so what you're, what you're going to see, Caitlin, is the president's going to continue to provide leadership. Uh, I expect uh, uh, as the debate in Congress goes forward about additional resources, we're going to look to build in incentives uh, for states to go forward. But uh, the president's made it clear. Um, and I think most parents in America would agree with him that we've got to get our kids back to school and we've got to get them back into the classroom and we can do it in a safe and a responsible way. That's okay. Uh, Bob, uh, Dr. Redfield, you're talking about the guidance that the CDC has put out. It sounds like you think it is in the best interest of students and ways to safely reopen schools so far. So are you going to change that guidance because the president said that he does not like it? Well, I think I just want to reiterate, we're going to continue to work with uh, local states uh, and jurisdictions. I think the guidance that we've put out uh, gives a, a series of different strategies for them to consider what is the most appropriate in their unique situation to adopt again, and I want to come back to the goal. And the goal of this is to get the schools reopened. I did mention, and I want to reiterate, that goal is just not a goal to reopen schools. That's a goal because we believe that's in the best public health interest of the students for the reasons you've heard. We will continue to develop and evolve our guidance to meet the needs of the schools and the states that we uh, continue to provide that assistance to. I, I, I'm sorry, I can't hear your question. Go ahead. Said, hey, 
the guidance, the guidance recommends that, stu that schools have social distancing of students six feet apart. And that's why these schools are adopting these hybrid models is because they don't feel they can keep students six feet apart within their, within their building. So I'm just wondering if that particular part of the guidance is something you're rethinking or do you support that social distancing inside schools? Because that's where schools, I think, are having trouble. Well, uh, the president said today we just don't want the guidance to be too tough. Uh, and that's the reason why next week uh, CDC is going to be issuing a new set of tools, five different documents that will be giving even uh, more clarity on the guidance going forward. But we know each school system uh, you know, has uh, unique capabilities, um, different facilities. And um, uh, what parents around the country should know is that uh, we're here to help. We're here to work with their uh, governors, with their local education officials to get our kids back to school. I mean, the truth of the matter is that as we, uh, as we reopen America, we've got we to reopen our schools um, for the well-being of our kids, for their academic advancement, for working families, uh, but also, as you've heard again today, uh, for, uh, to continue the momentum that we see in this economy that we saw last week with nearly 5 million jobs created. I, I want to promise the American people we're going to stay focused at this task force on saving lives, meeting the needs of our state and our health care workers, on protecting the vulnerable, uh, and reopening America's economy, uh, schools, work, and worship. So thank you all very much. We'll talk to you in a few days.